How's it going? Welcome to another episode of the James Loud Podcast. Today we have Black Sheep Genetics on the show. How are you doing today? James, it is a pleasure. I am stoked on life. Stoked to be back in the Bay and it's glorious. So I'm super excited to have you on the show today. We've been talking online for a long time. Yes. Uh, you've been in the industry a long time. You always uh, preach quality and terps. We have a mutual friend, Leo from Aficionado. So yeah, so welcome. Thank you, man. And on the terp tip, uh, we'll, we'll jump in right away because we have another mutual friend, Organic Brian. Oh, yeah. And I've been making uh, a blend of organic freeze-dried fruits and sucranat. Of all the forms of bricks, sucranat seems to be the number one. It's less processed. It's like these beautiful granulars. They sweep off the ground, and it tastes better than molasses. Wow. And old timer told me, so I took a note when he said, Sucranat's the one. Mark these represent Dos Rios. And uh, I built this new blend to boost terpenes, to boost THC, and uh, a side thing that came out of it that might be bigger than both of those is it preserves the quality of the cannabis. Really? So I brought some bud to show you uh, that's four years old. Wow. And it's bright green and it's amazing looking to where like more of that needs to happen because as we know in the jars, it's like, yeah, if they don't move it quick enough, then we're all in trouble. Well, it has a short shelf life. I like the Terp Locks for improving shelf life. I think yes. the Terp Locks do a great job. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, we mentioned Terp Locks in my breeding book. Sweet. I'm a huge fan. Uh, but yeah, and then I think improving the quality of the flower, you know, that sounds amazing. I think, you know, because you're combining all these fruits and I have some vegetables in there too and what have you, uh, the health of the plant and the, the vigor with the bricks yeah. is like so key. So, you know, just making it be able to repel bugs, not get mold, be happy. Right. Optimal plant health. At the end of the day, we're all looking for optimal plant health. Yeah. You said Leo uh, from Aficionado, and he told me, you know, when we're taking care of our ladies, uh, when they get sick, he gets sick. Really? When they get yeah. cold, he gets cold. No surprise there. Yeah. So I love being a plant myself on that note, you know? Deep for sure. connection. So let's uh let's talk about how you got started in the industry. The journey. The journey. Let's go back to the beginning. When did you start smoking? I first grew my first plant uh, in India in the Kulu Mountains when I was twelve. Really? And my mom and my pops uh, kind of bailed me out because I didn't fit in with the jocks and I didn't fit in with the preppies and I was in a New England old school hicked out town. So my subculture of skateboarders and, uh, and delinquents kind of ran a little wild. And she would say to the governor or people, if they asked how I was doing, that I wasn't in jail or the hospital, so I was doing good. And uh, they kind of made an intervention, and they took me to India for a year, took me out of eighth grade to show me the world. And uh, while I was free in India, I had a— account uh at one of the local stores that had fireworks so i got to like build multi-stage fireworks and there was wild cannabis and i you know had a connection with the plant where i didn't even choose it i started a garden uh behind my house that i was living at and in the center of one of the beds what comes up a glorious plant and it's legal in India. So my mom was like, sure, you know, rock and roll with that thing. Nice. And I grew that. We had a really fun time. One time we went down to the river and we cut all this feral cannabis and we piled it up in like a giant pile and lit it on fire. And we were dancing around it. And we didn't even know. Like right. we were pretty innocent, you know. Uh, and I said, children, weed of the corn. You know, right, it was mashing and fed cows, put cows to sleep. There's cows everywhere. So we're like, let's feed the cows. But uh, yeah, I got connected to it early on. And then uh, I kind of got my act together. I went to art school in Boston. And that's when I started working with the Canadians. Yeah. And as you know, you know, before 
Uh, I've heard you mention the green bud wave that came in and we were getting like the Canadian ice and other strains and boy, was it glorious. The orange crush. Yeah. There's the ice there. Yeah. There were so many good ones. I think they called the freeze too, right? Yeah. 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 And that stuff was moving good. And Boston had the most colleges per capita in the United States. And it was like, you know, duffel bags at the door and right. good times back in the day, you know, where uh, that city was good to me. And it kind of, I had made some great friends there and, and dove deeper into the, you know, cannabis life. I smoked. I'm leaving out the most important part. So after I came back from India, I was still connected to the plant and I'd cleaned my brain up a little bit and I was more on point and doing okay in school so you know no problems parents are happy and every day before homeroom we'd go down to an abandoned old church and we'd all fade on a blunt and east coast used to be uh phillies and you know we'd smoke the philly before homeroom and life was glorious and i sat around with those guys and i said james that i don't know what it was about herb but I knew I was going to smoke it my entire life and that like, it was, so, I'm like, I was in love with it. Yeah. And, you know, to parallel that then forward from Boston, you know, kind of got into the other side of things and, uh, and I moved to California. I was going to school for uh, computer animation in Boston at school of museum of fine arts and Tufts. And I also did kind of graph and some other art. And uh, then I saw what was happening out here in California and I was going to have to get a job out here. So came to take a peek and it was like Boston was in the dirt, you know, so competing against the best animation schools around where the industry is. Right. And so I toured around California with my dad. It was an epic road trip. We, we drove from L.A. Uh, up to the Bay. And at one point on the trip, we go by Vandenberg Air Force Base. And my dad was like, oh, I did not want to stop here. And we were prepared for like the whole way up the five, it's developed. Right. And then before you hit Vandenberg, there's like a 70 mile gap and like a 70 mile gap after it. Right. And the whole secret or the conspiracy, my dad was a big conspiracy guy, taught me a lot. And uh, he was like, they fly everything in from the ocean there. And it's like one road in, one road out. Hmm. And we rolled into this town kind of uneasy. And it was really strange with there was all the houses, the cars were parked in the driveways, no lights, no people. And we pull in, there's like one gas station. So we get gas and my old man's like, leave the car running. And he goes into the, uh, get some things and, uh, and get the gas. And while I'm sitting there, sheriff pulls up. And he pulls up and he rolls the window down a little bit and he just stares. And I'm like, okay, this is a little strange. And then behind him comes the Homeland Security vehicle. They roll down the window. They stare. At me. I'm like, okay, this is getting really strange. So I'm like, I'm going to take five and just maybe go take a bathroom break. And I go into the bathroom, I've been writing graph and, you know, having a good time coming up the road. And this bathroom had like uh, a word scratched in the wall, like out of a horror movie, like a thousand times, the same word. And I was like, oh, really sketchy now. So I come out, there's the sheriff and the Homeland Security. They're like, look at me, sheriff leaves, he leaves. My dad had an epic timing where he didn't see any of that. He's getting coffee and snacks or whatever. And uh, he rolls out and I was like, hey, you got to get out of here, you know? And uh, for the next like set of roads down the mile, we we're looking for a brain wiper, you know, or we like, if they take us in, we're not going to come out the same way. <laughs> no, we know. Yeah. So uh, I made my way up to San Francisco, went to the Academy of Arts and I was doing the arts like before, but really doing the herb. Yeah. And art school is kind of a farce to, to you know, uh, it's necessary sometimes, sometimes not. Right. But it was fun. 
And, you know, college for me was about connections and people. And I still am friends with some of the people that I met there. Totally. And uh, then I was out there doing that. And I started picking back up things with the cannabis. And uh, I had my father. He was, we were dealing with some family strife, thus the name Black Sheep. And so I said, Dad, you know, instead of you getting, you know, mistreated and having hard times, why don't you come out to California with me? And uh, originally he was all pumped up. He's friends with Paul Stamets. Oh, wow. And he moved into my apartment and he started growing mushrooms in one of the old uh, roommates' rooms. And then I was like, Dad, you know, I love the mushrooms and all, but we should really be growing some cannabis. So Pops was like, let's go. And I'm kind of good with people, um, business on the front. And he was, you know, the master grower in the back and the humility and the wisdom and father-son relationship. Nice. And we started growing in Oakland in 2003. Nice. Yeah. Those were good years. <laughs> those were good years. Amazing yeah. years. Not that there's been bad years, but there's been those were really good years. You know, I think instrumental years for cannabis and cannabis legalization. We were medical, and yeah, it, it was a special time, right? Especially in Oakland. Yeah, you know, the, especially. I mean, I was around in Oakland 2003, and I thought, you know, the genetics that we had, the passion, the people that were going and shopping at. You know, the dispensaries, I mean, people were really passionate about weed back then. The guy's growing the Can weed. Can I get that lighter? Absolutely. You're the man. Yeah. I mean, 2003, there was a handful of uh, places open, third floor, BPG. I went to all those. Yep. I'm familiar with everybody. The BPG go upstairs uh, back then. You used to have that little room upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the buyers would go upstairs. And yeah. we'd deny people for Are 36. Yep. We'd be like, no, we're passing on that. Like, yeah. We're moving on down. And you used oh, yeah. to do the run to where it was like, you had to work miracle. Your rent was due and you go out and you go around town and hit your spots. And the, you know, my dad put it most eloquently that I've ever heard in my life is we spend a short time with the plant. I like to think of myself as a shepherd of the plant. Sure. And, you know, we don't know where it's going. Yeah. But my dad told me the plant knows where it's going. Yeah. It knows every joint. It knows every bowl pack. It knows, you know, all the people it's going to touch. So to be a part of it and help it along its way, you know, uh, yeah. a booster rocket of sorts. Right. Sure. We're all just stewards at the end of the day. Bless. So, you know, that journey, uh, you know, that's kind of what kicked it off. And then in 2012 was the fallout. When indoor, you know, vanished uh, for the most part, I remember going to the grow stores and uh, they told me, don't buy anything, go next door to our used warehouse. And it was, there was more equipment in the used warehouse yeah. than there was in the main store. So I went to some people for wisdom. I worked with my father. Um, I was fortunate enough to be around people that I wouldn't have if I wasn't rolling with him that really cared about me and took care of me. And uh, I asked for wisdom from one of my mentors, Steve Smith, uh, owned HopeNet uh, with his family. Uh, he was running that with his wife at the time, Kathy, and uh, his boys helped him out too. And Steve uh, mentored me and said, well, and during this transition, uh, I think it's best for you to maybe look up to uh, Mendocino yeah. and, you know, expand. So he told me Willits was a great place, and we started looking for real estate. And little did I know that shutting down the 50 lighter, because I was so tired, we had three houses going, and it was like forever harvest, forever trims. And back like you, we were saying back in the day when we had one house with 14 lights and everybody was happy and we were making paper, it was less complicated. Yeah. And then, you know, more houses, more work to where I was, you know, at the tail end after, you know, almost 10 years in the Bay uh, burning out. So it was a revitalization of my cannabis spirit. Yeah. And the warrior marches on. But yeah. So let's talk about the genetics in 2003. What, what kind of genetics were you guys running when you first started growing 
What rhymes with 2003? GDP. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate enough to run the uh, Hell's Angels cut. And I don't know if you ever ran into the flat top purple. Uh-uh. They only had it at Grassroots. And Grassroots was a really great club to me back yeah. in the day. Dan and Kevin are legendary. They used to take their employees to Hawaii, like take care of people with family, you know. And Legend legendary. He legendary. And I also like the Urkel. I actually yeah. met the guy who made Urkel. Really? I'm like, I don't think anybody, have you, do you know anybody that knows him? Uh-uh. He's totally unknown. Yeah. Uh, I was at one of the first farmer's markets in Mendocino, and there was an old timer smoking a bong. And so I was like, okay, this guy's serious. Yeah. And I got to hanging with him for a little bit and chatting, and he's like, yeah, you know Urkel? I made purple Urkel. And I was like, what? And uh, he says to me, uh, GDP just took my Urkel and put Big Bud on it, and Big Bud sucks. Yeah. And I was like, we all know if you came in with a pack of the Urkel done right versus a pack of the GDP, the Urkel was taken. Urkel was fire. The Urkel was amazing. It wasn't as big of buds, though. It was definitely smaller buds, but the terps were there. You had that real floral, floral terp. You know, right, you didn't have to cut the tops of terps, off on yeah. week eight. Right. Because they rot. We all dealt with GDP where it was the most beautiful plant. Yeah, but You're GDP, oh, it oh, was the slowest top. vegging too. Yeah. They, they were the shortest, slowest vegging plants. Yeah, it was good stuff. I yeah. used to use the dual spectrum. Yeah. The HPS with the metal halide. Wow. And that veg things for me, the best is still my, you know, I haven't gotten into the new LED world, so I'm old really? school in that sense. I like HPS. I still like HPS. I still think HPS creates a great product. Uh, you know, LED creates a good product too. What's think, your opinion on seeds that are bred under HPS and performing, outperforming uh, the new LEDs with the old school HPS because of maybe epigenetics? And I'm like, is that a far? Some people say not true. Some people say true. So I'm just, you know, looking for more. Show know. me the money. Show me the results. I mean, I think we're we're R and Ding stuff right now. Yes. So I'm doing a lot of R and D side by side LED versus HPS, also with seed production. I know with reversals, I can tell you reversals under HPS are significantly better. Uh, you know, we're talking about far red and stuff like that in the spectrum. Right. I think that adds to it. So I do my reversals right now, but we're also experimenting on what is the best way to do a reversal, not only reversal spray, but also spectrum, um, you know, and then collecting pollen versus using live plants. I prefer using live plants when I'm pollinating, but collecting pollen is a, you know, a way to hedge your bets for sure. Yeah, so, I like taking the tops off of a live pant and putting them into a bag and then, you know, getting the right before when the bells are just about to open, they're all swollen. Yeah. And I just zen in the garden. I've even put on, I have, um, my spirit animal is a wolf. Sometimes when I'm doing the breeding, it's my most passionate, it's my heart. So I put my wolf suit on and I head out and I pull out the branch out of the bag when there's no wind yeah. and I just open the flowerettes because I'm like you, I want that natural drift. I don't yeah. get a paintbrush anymore. I've tried that. The hair's a bit all no, red. It's magnetism too. We were talking about magnetism. There's all kinds of other things at play. I do a pollen, uh, I do a pollen wand. I don't know if you've ever seen that no. where, you, where you take when you're, when your pollen's dumping on those branches and you really want to hit the room up rather than shaking it, I'll take and cut off the male flowers, tape up several of them like a bouquet and walk around dusting them, you know, you get some good swings and it definitely floats and, you know, pollen's a lot of fun. I, I think that, I, that side of the, the plant is amazing to work with. So. I did a garden. I, I don't have neighbors close by and I had retired out of, you know, commercially growing and I just did a seed patch and I let everything go and I had multiple males and, you know, I called the ones that I might not have liked, but I left a lot. And I really got to watch them just in their natural habitat come to fruition. And, you know, I made the note as a breeder, you know, we spend this time doing the selection, but the plants seem to also know to where I had my early males get on my early girls. Yeah. 
and you know the late ones you know finding their mates and whatnot and it was really special to me to just let them zen and i was walking through james where i bump into a plant and it was like a pollen cloud yeah and there's videos of me just surrounded by pollen and it's sparkling and i'm like that's our fairy dust yeah well and it's amazing time it's it's amazing to see pollen fly if you really seen pollen fly where it's like a wall it's almost like a cloud coming in it's just and then sometimes it'll just sail over the top of the canopy that's that's great you know my it's first a lot of fun. time i ever bred now i gotta tell you the story so i asked the gouders it's one of the most legendary families in round valley uh, mikey g is a real legend in the industry 23 pound plant 23 pound plant 23 pound plant 20 feet tall by 12 Plus. feet wide. Yeah. Oh, wow. Plus. He was growing the pink Cadillac and I got to see it. And like, this guy's been amending his holes so long. There's like a pallet of chicken shit per hole. Wow. And they're mounded up all high. Just it's been reworked and reworked. He's got big mounds. And I saw that plant and I was like, man, he, of course, his name is Mikey. And I'm like, cause he's Michael Jordan. And then uh, he walks up to it and he's like, it's got three layers of netting. And he's, he's like, takes a huge cola and it's probably a half pound. And he bends it down all the way to the ground, like rubs the ground. And he's like, look at how strong it is. And you and I know some strains can bend and some will snap. Yeah. But just to see that strength and that connection. Totally. And I had set out for a couple of years after that being like, I'm going to grow a 20 pound plant. And I was like, well, maybe in the future, but I recognized, you know, I'm good at ball, but you're seeing Michael Jordan. Yeah. And, you know, just to be around them and to see that Zen, uh, magic. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. When your limit's six plants, yeah, that, they, that can go a long ways. Hey, 25, they used to, when I first yeah. moved to Mendo, they were like, unless you pull 250, you're just losing. Yeah. And it was like, that's, it was a daunting task coming from indoor rooms where we're like 20 pounds. Yeah. 40 pounds. But uh, I got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. And I was part of uh, the, the 9 one one program in Mendocino with the 99 plants, which was the... I wish we could go back. Yeah. Old Doc Hop used to give out the certs where you'd go there and there'd be a line for like three hours. Wow. With like 50 people because he had said that you could grow 99 plants with his cert. Yeah. And if the sheriff busted you, I don't think he was going to tell you that he could. But a lot of people, including me, were under that mirage. Sure. And, uh, you know, in cannabis, there's a constant, you know, people have to realize that that's been a it's it's a difficult industry to navigate like you and me finding good advice or the right people it's the most valuable thing yeah people talk about terroir and yeah there's the ground and the air and the dirt but don't forget about the friendships and the yeah. farmers and like that and is the knowledge the Absolutely. knowledge right yeah. like we go to somebody's garden and there's always something that shines yeah where you're like everybody grows different and, you know, a thousand ways to skin a cat, but uh, you see that gold and everybody, I pick up, you know, the little nuances and something from this garden and something from that garden. And it takes years to get good. That's what a lot of people don't understand. They want an instant gratification. So, you know, you'll have good weed. You might have good weed your first time. You might not. Right. But if you keep doing it, no matter what, you are going to get good. And that's just how it works. I mean, I, everything's kind of like that in life, but definitely growing and if you're passionate and you love it, you are going to get to grow good weed. It's yeah. just a matter of time. We had hard apprenticeships, apprenticeships back in the day. You know, you and I worked in a, a criminal time where you wore a lot of hats in this business. You know, yeah. you're an electrician, security man, uh, family man. Contractor. Contractor. Yeah, everything. You do the funny stories you tell people. I tried not to drift too far, or at least you could connect somewhat to reality to be like, oh, yeah, I'm HEVAC guy. We're working on a double stage system with, you know, yeah. we're silencing the motors. Right. Yeah, that was key. They bubble wrapped the motors back in the day because that thing was humming at midnight. Yeah. 
and it quieted up. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of problems to be solved back then. Uh, and then without the internet, it was all about the circle of people you knew. Now the internet's opened it up with information, but it's still hard to decipher what's right and what's wrong, you know, because you'll hear on the internet 20 different opinions on the same thing. Salt versus organic versus cocoa versus aquaponics, uh, you know, DWC, whatever. And they're all, they're all fine. You just have to learn how to tweak them and get them for you and figure out if that's the path you want to go down. Right. I think it's really, you know, interesting now that the market's expanding and we're getting into agricultural equipment and yeah. what they're talking about and, uh, you know, moving things forward in large fields uh, specifically, I've been talking with someone that grows this amazing varietal uh, of Conef uh, and fiber, and it's a hibiscus hybrid. Wow. And the seeds look like triangles. They're black. They're like the size of a dime. Really? And it grows, the stalk is like 30% more uh, than any other stock on like in the game. Yeah. And it doesn't have THC. It doesn't have CBD. So all these pitfalls that now we're seeing, you know, like um, my buddy's in Iowa and he's one of the only four licenses and he grows CBG. Yeah. And CBG helps people. We don't even understand how much yet. Cancer. Yep. It's a winner. And THCA, CBG, they are just amazing. Golden. He was, the first time he grew it, he was all paranoid because he's like, what's up with this stuff on the plants? And he said it was almost like a powder. Yeah. And that was the CBG, yeah. I guess, an expression of Non-psychoactive, uh, both, both THCA and CBG, non-psychoactive. CBD is also non-psychoactive. But I mean, all these cannabinoids are extremely beneficial. We're just scratching the surface on how they can be used and how they can be worked in with drugs and other things, you know, on the drug discovery side, I think we're going there and it's not going to stop and we're going to learn a lot. Right. So we were talking, this guy's in contract and working with some large people in oil and gas. Yeah. And this plant is three times, uh, uh, reduces the carbon fr uh, footprint three times a rainforest. Yeah. So there's a lot of incentive. And like I was saying, with the world market opening up, it's like uh, we're working with an engineer, um, Jason Ramondi. He worked for Coca-Cola, then Lagunitas, Boonville, uh, Ale. And then I met him in a, a dive bar where they have the best burgers in Ukiah. We were eating lunch with my dad. And me and my dad were like, we've been waiting our whole lives to meet you. Is this recently or? This is going back a, a ways yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, to where I also had a business called Waska. Nice. You may be familiar with or not. Did you ever sip one? No. It's cannabis infused hemp milk. Awesome. 400 shops, James. Wow. 215. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Office in LA, an office in San Francisco on Market Street. Nice. Filled with freezers. We made it fresh frozen. My dad invented fresh frozen manufacturing. Really? Yes. Amazing. We need to get him on the show. Oh, man, he is. Yeah. He's in my heart and he's in the sky. So oh, wow. if the lights flicker, that's his 12th dimensional communication. So we'll keep our eyes peeled. Amazing. Yeah. So Waska, um, the oldest edible of time is bong oh yeah and they drink in india it's still ceremonially drank by the uh military yeah. once a year and steve smith had made some at hope net and i tried brownies and uh everything under the sun and when i drank this drink i was like what is happening yeah well people don't believe weed is psychedelic but it can be psychedelic Why and not? i've had the same kind of experience with bang so, right. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, he was kind of my grandfather uh, and my mentor. And I went to him and I said, you know, I really like your milk and I want to make something like it. And he said, as long as you make something different, then go for it. And so I was like, let's put hemp milk in it. Yeah. And instead of cow milk, uh, all of these problems with milk and people being lactose intolerant. 
Not to mention that my genius idea there that I felt was putting it in with the plant. Yeah. And so I'm like, the hemp is it, the herb is it, yeah. it's multidimensional, multiverse. And uh, we started making this hemp uh, infused chocolate milk. And so, like you said, psychedelic, it surely was. Yeah. The stories that I hear, you know, I served over 400,000 bottles. Wow. And I like the good stories versus the bad ones. Sure. You know, you hear a lot more bad stories than you do good stories. So paranoia. A, a, all, yeah. <laughs> like you, oh, the, the list goes on. But, you know, what shines for me is when, you know, we would drink it with a couple of friends and you'd feel like you're in high school and people would start bouncing around the trampoline, yeah. laughing nonstop, having a great time. And the wavelength of it, uh, we always put in multiple strains. We were like into the entourage effect. I wanted to fill the wheel out before it was even the wheel. Yeah. And, you know, when I said my dad invented Fresh Frozen, it was specific for like edible manufacturing. I'm sure there's some other people that also were experimenting with that at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were running trim at the table and uh, the old man didn't want to deal with it. So he said, just stick it in the freezer with the garbage bag. And then, you know, we were running through material, making the milk. And he said, grab that bag out of the freezer. Let's try that out. Yeah. And uh, we started working with that. And it was like, yeah, just like live rosin. You yeah. know, there's a world of difference. So we were like, we're running with this. And... Uh, we built that up, James, to where even out in Mendocino, I had a 10K garden and we put on Leatherman gloves and we stripped the entire garden and we pack them into five pound bricks. I seen people doing fresh frozen manufacturing and it's painful. I'm like having 20 trimmers come out to your farm and sit on a table and manicure it all fresh. That's nice and all, but I don't have the money to pay for that. And yeah. I don't want to see it come out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. And I had one of the most robust extraction techniques ever to see cannabis with putting it into a boiling kettle of milk and just letting it ride. When we made the milk and uh, got things going, uh, you expanded. Uh, we were inspired, like you said, by uh, the hallucinogenic experience it offered. So we came up with the name Chakawaska. Nice. Inspired by Co Capelli and Ayahuasca. Oh, yeah. And like you said, people would have an experience. And to put that into perspective, like we had a guy who was cocky at the trim table. And he was like, bro, edibles don't, don't hit me. I, I'm not even sweating. It. I'll, I'll ace a huge amount of Wasca. And my dad and I were like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, And, you know, we waited and got the last bottom of the barrel, just like in a whiskey barrel, you know, like really good stuff back then. And uh, we filled up a glass for him. And it was like, you needed two ounces of this stuff and you were floored. Yeah. And he drank the glass. And uh, it, we, he, I'm bringing him back to his place after it was after the trim. We made sure not to give it to him while we were working. Sure. So right before he leaves and we, I'm giving him a ride back from Oakland to San Francisco and he's, he's starting to get a little shaky. And, uh, I said to him, what are you going to do? Like, what are you doing right now? And he was like, Oh, I have this date with this girl. I'm about to go home, just chill for a couple minutes, get ready, get some food. And then I'm going out. And I was like, that's awesome. And, uh, and then it starts hitting him harder. I mean, it's coming in heavy and he's like, Bro, can you get me a drink? And I was like, yeah, sure. And we're right next to a packy. So we're like, I swing in. I'm in the, like, parked and ready to go in, like, 10 seconds. And he opens the door slowly. And he stands up and he holds the door and he just stands. And then he gets back in the car. And he's like, I can't go in there right now. And I'm like, all right, we're, we'll get right back to your crib. And we're driving to his crib. We're on this, this packy is his corner packy store. And we're on his street. And he says to me, where the hell are we right now? <laughs> so I leave him at his house and I'm looking at him in the rear view as I'm pulling off. And he's just standing in the middle of the road. Oh, man. And he said he calls his roommate up uh, from his couch. 
and he couldn't even talk. It was like his roommate would like heard murmuring. And he's like, wait, are you in your room right now? Because he could hear murmuring from the other room. He's like in the living room and he's there on the couch. And he was like, it was a three day long trip, James. He was like, it was more powerful than any psychedelic he had ever taken. He was like, all I did was sleep and eat and like fry. Yeah. So, you know, not that I want people to go that far, but again, like you were saying, that you can have the ceremonial experience. You can repair It is a ceremonial experience at a certain level. And people don't understand. Most people, unless you've gone there, you wouldn't fully understand. You know, it's not just heightened perception. You know, your perception's heightened or whatever. It's like you can get full colors. You can have crazy experiences. It's not hallucinating. Yeah, I wouldn't say you're going to hallucinate like LSD. Right. Or like mushrooms or like some of these other, but it is psychedelic. Definitely. Especially colors, man. I've seen some wild colors and had, you know, I mean, hallucinations out of the peripheral and like the whole world is alive, you know, stuff like that. And good and bad. I've had bad too. I've had bad experiences from eating too much. (laughs) So we uh, said the uh, the strains in the early 2000s. I thought of something on the way over that I thought would be a lot of fun. I said, why don't we just tag team and go through some of the ones I like and you like, and we'll go back and forth. We'll give it a quick little run. Nice. Green Crack. Blue Dream. Same people. OG Kush. Chem Dog. Sour Diesel. Chem Sis. Ogre. Ooh. Aota. This is great, actually. This uh, is great. Yes. Uh, let's go to Flat Top Purple. Okay. We'll go to, uh, from Flat Top Purple, we're going to go to Romulan. Purple Kush. Purple Kush. Uh, Mendo Perps. Afghani. Uh, Afgu. The candy. The Afgu. I love it. Hindu Kush. Yes. Tallest plant ever. Yeah. Insane in the grow room. We Af- had no. Afi was epic and it was so frosty. We had no yeah. idea. We flipped it at like three weeks and shit. Five feet tall. We had like maximum as it. I'm yeah. still super cropping up the top, you know, being like, I got it, you know. Totally. Knock it down. <laughs> Pushing it between the lights. Yeah. As it grows up past them. Yeah. Yeah. No. no. Well, I managed to, I used to bend them over. If we had to knock the room down, I'll knock it down a foot, two yeah. feet, and just put that knuckle in. Yeah. Everybody's got finesse with that. Okay. So we went Afku, Romulan. What's your next string? Uh, let's go. Ja, oh, Jagu. Jagu. That was, that was an interesting one. That's what's in this jar. Nice. Yeah. Uh, purple Cadillac. Purple Cadillac. Princess Purple. Train wreck. We grew train wreck. <laughs> Better than the San, there was two cuts, the Arcadia yeah. cut uh-huh. and the San Francisco cut. And my dad and I grew train wreck. Shout for, out to Ty. Big up, Ty. <laughs> yeah. Dank plant. My dad grew train wreck and we brought it into the shop and they said, you grew it better than the people that made it. Nice. And I was like, I can't sell it to you. Yeah. And I was like, I'm taking it to LA. (laughs) And an epic mission to LA where I was back when, you know, people used to put names on things. You mentioned some old clubs, CCG, the first one, uh, California caregivers. Yep. And they were down in, uh, originally they had the ba- uh, Oakland by, and then they had the San Francisco on the Easter on a bus. And I remember going in there, and if they had it on the menu, Blue Dot. Blue Dot. Yeah, that's a good one. Blue Dot. Uh, Red Dot. Red Dot, Blue Dot. Oh, man, there were so many good ones. So Bla- many, Black bro. Domina. Oh, Black Domina. Black Domina. The ladies love Black Domina. Black Domino was good. I Juice, don't know. Is juicy fruit? You juicy remember the juicy fruit? fruit. Uh, cotton candy. Cotton candy. The real uh, Triple bubble. X. Go to Doug V's. The yep. shit. Triple X OG. Triple yep. X OG. Doug V, yep. rest in peace. Good stuff. Yeah, OG. And then there's, you know, you can go down the list of OGs. Right. right there was the Diablo, the Tahoe, uh, the Josh D. SFV. There was the SFV. There was the kosher. 
There was the true OG. There was the pure OG. There was, I mean, the, the names go on and on. You know, the Ortega OG. Was, yeah. Let them know. Ortega yeah. OG. Sonoma OG. Sonoma OG. It was a SFV, Fino, or a Cro- It was amazing. Like that. Yeah. The Sonoma OG. We worked with that a lot. That was a good one. There were so many. Everywhere there was OGs. Some of them were the same. Some of them were different. Some were renamed. Uh, right. Man, it's like. That OG was, that was, was moving in LA for. A uh, hundred dollars an eighth. I remember Fairfax dispensary had six windows, which was like legendary at the time, or six counters to sell at, and it was hundred dollar eighths just flying out the door. Yeah, going down and working in that time was uh, a lifestyle. Yeah. You know why we did this thing? So much fun. So much fun, and I feel like you're either meant to do it or you you're not meant to do it. It's like either you love it or you don't love it. Either. You know, there's people that are wearing it for the wrong reasons too, but the people that are passionate are still doing it. We're still here. Right. Right. You know, I still, we still love talking about weed as you can tell. Passionate. Look, I've been charging this for a year. And what's today, James, a full moon. Nice. And I like to crack the beans. I got rainwater and at on deck at home. Nice. And I throw them in uh, above uh, the stove where it gets nice little ambient heat. Yeah. It's you, dark. You do plates with a paper towel or you uh, just I'm do- I'm just an old in, school uh, shot glass or a glass guy. Yeah. You do straight water. You do- I rain water. Rain, oh, you do rain water. Rain water. Nice. Bro. Hydrogen peroxide, anything like that? You just do no, straight water. No, my rainwater. seeds are so clean and yeah. I'm growing my own genetics, so I don't have to- Clean off broad mites. <laughs> oh, talk about a dirty seed. Oh, man. Where have you mentioned that there's eggs on the seeds? And I'm like, scary. Bad. But yeah, running clean seeds, running the rainwater. Yeah. I'm not, you You know, I, I bought a lot of inputs and me and you have been farming so long. Again, we get more and more into learning about how to, what we need and where to get it. So it's all coming from my land. That's I went amazing. Out, I went out and foraged 200 pounds of wild mushrooms with my kids. I saw the video. I saw the video. You guys are crushing the mushrooms. Yeah, that's amazing. Threw them in the compost. Golden like, Amanita. You had a golden Amanita in there. That mad golden, golden Amanita's yeah, that, in there. I had the wild. devil's cap, which is this mushroom that's like this big. And yeah, I went to the compost pile this year, James, and I was like, I want to show it the most love I can. Yeah. And I was like, how do I make the best compost? And I was like, putting in things, you know, little Wheezy said it pretty well, where I'm so grateful because I have ideas that no one else thinks of. And I don't know why, but man, am I grateful. And, you know, so building into the compost and I was throwing my terps in, I'm throwing the mushrooms in, I'm throwing uh, my mentor's weed in. So it's basically biodynamic, one step above organic. You're doing it all with locally processed inputs. Correct. I can cut the hay. Yeah. I have equisetum, arboretum, uh, yeah. silica at my disposal where I get the husks and layer that. I'm like, uh, hay is great, but I love to layer the silica husks and then just let them break down. Yeah, that's awesome. Stalks. Again, we like to see thigh pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Do your piles get hot? Uh, they do, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I turn it over and and nice. work it, and then depending on sometimes I'm like experimenting with taking it stuff that's partially broken down. Yeah, because I've done experiments with terpenes where I put in fresh crushed grapes. Uh, my friend had Concord grapes, and I crushed them up like the wine guys with my feet and threw it on top of the plants. And there was mad fruit flies, but it was outdoors, so I didn't care. And, you know, that year was kind of mm, a little bit of a hint. But then the next year, the plant tastes like pure grape. That's awesome. So I'm like, there's something to be said to letting it just organically break down. Yeah. So I'm leaving chunks of fruit in this time. You know, I saw apples in the pile and uh, uh, rosebuds and uh, different fruits. I have an amazing ancient orchard uh, around my property and on my property. Wow. So it was like, I was just getting pears. I'm getting uh, everything that drops and, you know, huge side-by-side loads of fruit and dumping it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So building the dirt. I mean, it's fun. Again, uh, P. 
people say farmer. This is a big thing that I got so like wrecked on. Do you know what farmer means historically? Someone who works the farm. I thought so too. Mm -hmm. Until I found out historically a farmer is a tax man. And he collected taxes. And back in the days when we're talking about these farms, they were huge. Yeah. And there were workers and peasants. And the workers and the peasants worked the fields and the farmer collected the taxes. Huh. So I'm like, I'm not a farmer anymore. I'm done with that, with yeah. cannabis. I don't represent myself like that. Uh, and on that note, I said, what's in Eden? A garden. And I'm like, I'm a gardener. Nice. Yeah, and I like saying that, you know, totally. gardener, you know. Steward, gardener, that's yeah, it. yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, that's the Garden up. of Eden. Yep. And so I planted fruit trees this year in my patch. It was one of my favorite experiences of my life to go to the uh, grow store where, you know, I spend 100 bracks and nutrients over the years and dirt and pick up trees. And I was just smiling and everybody there was so happy. And I planted them for my family, for my children, for my wife. I said, me and you have difficult things. Staying in the cannabis with our families is extremely challenging. Yeah. It's uh, different than a lot of other industries where there's ups and downs and uh, unexpected territory. So, you know, to have uh, the family with you, and behind you is sacred, and uh, they help me uh, to this day. And I put roses in the garden, James, because sometimes me and my wife might have a tough day. And I said, I want to remind myself to uh, how beautiful love is, and that if I plant more roses in the garden, then it will remind me how beautiful my life is, and my wife is, and my children are, and all the great people on this planet. That's awesome. And, you know, more of that, please. Yeah. And I said, the trees will grow up around and the ganja plants will grow in the center. You can eat the fruit. I always love walking around outdoor patches with fruit trees. Yeah. And it's like on the garden tour, like when you go through your room, room to room, you know, outdoor, it's uh, bed to bed and you're eating the fresh fruit because everything is ready. It's harvest time. It all comes down. It all comes down. Yeah, so let's talk about genetics for a little bit. I mean, you're a breeder. You do seed production. You do a lot of stuff. I uh, brought my box. You brought the box. From my, this is part of my seed vault, and it's a little dirty because it's dirty on the hill. Yeah. You know, people talk about how you keep your seeds. This is a good thing. I like to keep mine in this generic box in yeah. the garage in a cool place. Nice. And uh, you can, Do you control humidity? Uh, it stays ambient and cool. Yeah. It's a three stall uh, garage with an office and a two room. So the back room is just kosher. Nice. And uh, yeah, if I need to close the door or run a heater, I mean a cooler, I'm dyslexic. Yeah. Part of my genius. People don't know about dyslexia. They always look at it as a, uh, you know, I was brought up as a learning disability. Mm-hmm. And it's like, my mom was an amazing advocate, taking me to India, helping me with my dyslexia. And what people don't realize is people with dyslexia uh, get confused. It's like the bus going from the left to the right. Usually people know their route and they go to the right side and they come up with similar answers. But when you're dyslexic, you go to the other side. And I love the saying straight out of left field. Yeah. And you come up with something different. And also have ADD where like I can single task better than anyone in the room. And, you know, people talk about ADD with being losing your attention and not being able to focus, but it's actually quite the opposite. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm loving that superhero aspect. And, you know, my mom went to a seminar about dyslexia. And after they told them all these brilliant things that dyslexics can do, the first question from the crowd was, what do I have to do to become dyslexic? So to everyone out there that has that, you know, I, I applaud you. And it can be challenging, but it can also be rewarding. So, yeah. And genetics. So I brought the box. Black Sheep Genetics. 
And I had, I said, you know, I wanted to really just show you some of the work. And here it is, like me and you make it. I have fancy packaging. Show you some of that. Cool with the colors. Absolutely. But then I also got our tried and true siftis. Good stuff. Yeah. So I brought out some of my library that we can start checking out. I came up with a really cool thing, I think, for the industry. You know, I like to be creative. I'm an inventor. I'm an alchemist. Uh, and so there's all this waste. Yeah. And the seed packages, you know, nobody cares about this. Right. Right. And so I said, I've counted so many seeds with the cards, with the spinnies, with a lot of things. And then I had the epiphany, what about a pill pack? And uh, that pill packs are made specific sizes. So they have like zero, zero in a range. Sure. And then I said, I could just go over the swipe card, like the path, they, the way they fill pill packs is they have a board and then you set them in mm -hmm. and then you just swipe a card over it and it fills to the volume. Right. So I match the volume to the quantity of seeds and the size of the seed. And then I'm putting them in these gelatin pill packs. Nice. And I'm like, that's biodegradable. Yeah. It's a great way to compact it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the future of this is to have, you know, a 10 um, cell pack. Sure. And have 10, I shared pollen last year with 10 farms. And it was an experiment, James, let me tell you, to where some of them made some seeds, some of them didn't. That's how it goes. Yeah. yeah that's how it goes. And I feel you. My, my goal is that one day we can share pollen and put in 10 of our selects from each different breeder. Nice. And gift, you know, that as, you know, ultimate pheno hunt. Yeah, well, and it's really good if you have something that you really like and to be able to take the pollen from that, put it on 10 different things from 10 different people and then grow those out and and look at what was passed on by the parents, uh, you get some interesting results and you really start to understand your lines better. I think that's a great way to understand your breeding lines. Uh, and it's also a fun way to collaborate with your friends and people that are out there. You know, it's it's great. Higher Heights is, you know, has high standards. Yeah. And uh, he was like, unless you make the four plants, I'm not even willing to accept it as yours. Wow. And, you know, he says you make the first cross. Yeah. And then you make the second cross. And then you and cross, then you them cross those. Yep. And then it's yours. Right. And he works with Shiloh a lot. I really enjoyed the show with you and Shiloh. Yeah, that was a good one. That was a fun one. He's, it, he's a character. It was awesome. Yeah. And Organic Brian, like I said, that's my other comrade. That's who I'm working with the nutrients on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so back to genetics, my ADD, I'm all over the place. Uh, let's run through some. I'll just give you some names and then we can talk about them. So I got the pineapple Zasio. Yeah. I've got a couple Zasio crosses. I really like the Z41. Yeah. You know, uh, Baccio 41. It's a good one. It's uh, a really good one. We got it's seeds still of that slapping too. out there. I got seeds of that in the next room. Zaccio sure. cherry pie, throwback classic. Doesn't get powdery mildew. Nice. Was the problem with cherry pie when we grew Girl Scout cookies and cherry pie? I yeah. honestly like cherry pie better. Yeah. But then it got PM in the room. Sure. And we were like, we can't run it. All right. And then uh, this is a polyploid that I bred, uh, pineapple caviar. I crossed Leo's. Pineapple tie. He searched the world like two times over for it yeah. and found the original, such a cool plant, uh, with his white caviar, nice. which was really nice plant. I know he's doing some breeding with it now. Again, he's brought it out. So um, I'm looking for his creme rosé. Who's got the creme rosé? That shit's fire. That we got to we got to hit him up. Yeah, I got to hit him up. Yeah. I, I don't think he has it right now, but somebody has it out there. Frenchie kept everything. Nice. Frenchie was the vault for him. Yeah. He explained that is every seed they got. I just got some of his vanilla berry pie. I don't know if you remember that. I ran one. it. So, yeah. So, I did too. In, in 2018, I ran it. It was out in probably 2016. Same year. Yeah. Same year. And so, out of a patch of a lot of plants in my buddy's backyard, there was this little area of these white plants. 
and, and they stood out from 50 feet away and everybody that would go back there would be like, what's that? What's that? We lost the cut. It was the best. And the Terps were amazing. It was super terpy. It was berries and it was gas and it was amaz- amazing nose. I mean, it was very, very loud. All of the expressions were loud out of 10 seeds or 12 seeds. I don't remember what it was, but super white and super frosty and sticky. Like the old school sticky. You don't see sticky as much as you used to. I hear you. Uh, it's like a photographic memory for me, James. Yeah. And I could see vanilla berry pie on row five in my upper patch, 18. Yeah. And it was similar because we had people walking through the gardens. And I kid you not, people said the exact same thing coming through my patch, yeah. being like, what's that? And the structure of it, it branched out. Yeah. It grew so uniformed and strong. Strong boom, and just, boom, yeah. Boom, 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 just kept going. Yeah. Yep. So Leo gave me 20 of those seeds. We're running them here. That's what we're in the, in the middle of running. Yeah. I'm glad to bring back some of these things. You're talking about bringing that back. Guess what I have popped? What do you got? I want Caleb, the librarian, uh, CSI. Yeah. It just released GDP. Yeah, I and saw Urkel. him. On. Yeah, and Urkel. I was like, and Bubba, he's got Bubba, Bubba as well. Yes. <laughs> Bro, I gave the Bubba to one of the best indoor growers that I knew. And I was like, I'm not sure if you're going to want to run this. And he was like, definitely. Yeah. And I was like, yes, I. And as much as you and I can grow, you know, you got to give some other things to other people because we can't grow it all. No. So I'm doing the GDP and I'm doing the Urkel from him. Yeah. And then Urkel tends to be trickier where he ran a couple different phenos. He's on his shit. Yeah. And uh, uh, so he had like plant number 106 and 103. And then he made a cross of grape ape Urkel. And I was like, yes, please. I really want to revitalize the perps. So what do you think grape ape is genetics wise? Because I, I don't know. I'm not asking as a trick question or anything, but like, Grape Ape, there was the big argument between Grape Ape and GDP being sisters. I don't know. They're, they're very different plants. I mean, they're completely, they grow very different. From what I understand, Mr. Perps, man, made yeah. the Grape Ape. Yeah. Rest in peace, Mr. Perps. Yeah, there's, a, there's somebody else out there trying to take credit. We're not even going to say his name on the show. But, uh, you know, either way, it doesn't even matter. Same thing with GDP. They're both amazing. Yes. Grape Ape. Was a, it would stack. It would get huge. Whereas fucking GDP would be small and, dude, pungent, super pungent. And I think Great Ape was more subtle. We used to run nine plants in a four by four. Yeah. We had played with all the numbers. It's like if you were growing GDP, the magic number was nine for us. Nice. Yeah. My dad used to run a flashlight over my canopy when I started apprenticing under him. And he said, if he could see the light, then I was screwing up. Wow. And, you know, That's our funny. canopies were so solid. Yeah. And we used to run, you know, uh, back in the day, there was two types of growers. I'd like to say, you know, in the, on the ends, there was the PG&E growers and there was the other growers. Right. And so we were putting up three lights per table. Yeah. With the ultimate goal of getting, you know, four pounds out of a four by eight table. Three lights per table, three six hundreds. Three thousand. Three thousands on a. Three thousands. My wow. old man was a savage where we bought Hortolux and were suckers for a while. And then he was like, check this out, son. And he pops open a case and it's GEs. Yeah. And he got them for 20 bucks. And he was like, we're relamping every run. So and he loved cleaning the ballast out. Right next to each other, you'd have three thousands yeah. on a four by four. That's it. Split the <laughs> yeah, table yeah. with three thousand. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, we did. I did 600s. I never did thousands like that, but we did 300. We used 600s. to do uh, ebb and flow, flood and drain. Yeah. And GDP was like, I grew it for years. I mothered it for years. Uh, I had, like I said, the Hell's Angels cut, which was amazing. And uh, I found that it was like a swamp plant, James. Yeah. I used to flood my trays for 12 hours. And then let them out. And it was the purplest, happiest plant it ever could be. So what type of hoods did you use when you were going 3000s? Did you guys use the air-cooled? 
So uh, you were we were we were using six inch air cooled. Yeah. Uh, my old man would go to the grow. We, we used to go up the street here to Growers Choice. Yeah. Uh, and Metallica's uh, band would come in and buy stuff from them, and we'd see other people, and they had their pit bulls that are like the scariest pit bulls known to man. Yeah. And uh, my dad would break out the light meter at the grow store, and he was friends with Steve. And he'd have Steve turn all the lights on, and my dad would geek. Uh, he was a scientist. My father actually did missile propulsion for Raytheon. And uh, so he was just straight specking the lights. And we found the top ballast from, you know, all the ones they had. And at that time, I believe we were working with Hordelux. Uh, yeah. or, no, it wasn't Sun... Sun something, sun, sun systems, sun, sun systems, or something like yeah. that. The old thousand watt metal. I ballast. remember, yeah. And then we used to have to replace caps, yeah. bring it to the grocery store, get a new cap. Totally, ballasts were separate. A whole, whole different world back then. Right. You could put the ballast above the room if you wanted to. If you're real smart, you put them above the room because there was all that buzzing. Right. Right. We used to yeah. also hang our cleaners, our scrubbers yeah. above the room. And on that, you know, I love because so many people use the scrubbers the right way. And when you use a scrubber the right way, what are you doing? Using it the wrong way. Because the way I came to figure it out was you run it backwards. Really? And we used to reverse the flow. And instead of blow out, we'd suck in. Hmm. And my dad would joke about it because we had a 12-inch fan on top of a big, you know, can. Yeah. And he'd be like, don't get your hair caught in that hippie. Like, pull on your hat and stuff, you know, and people were walking by it. But it was way more productive, and mm. you didn't have to duct it or, you know, just to reverse it and slam it back out. Yeah. My old man was diligent about building the rooms where when you shut the door, it would suck. Yeah. Boom. You had that reverse pressure, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all about that reverse pressure. Hey, I said your new room's flat white. I love it. My favorite color in a grow room. Yeah, so let's talk about how you got started with breeding. You you know, did you what did you start breeding for? I was started breeding because, you know, I had done all other facets where, you know, you get tired of repeat. And I always like to my old man said push the science. Um, and, and experiment. Sometimes I get pissed because he'd run around perfect and they'd change something up and it wouldn't be as good. But he made his case for, you know, uh, pushing things forward. And uh, on that note, I think when I had finished up, you know, indoors and went to outs, then I did some depths. Uh, and I did greenhouse and, you know, the, the final frontier for me was breeding. Yeah. And so, you know, to have the chance to make my own plant was the most special opportunity. And I went into that and you said the pollen chucking before. And I was halfway into that story uh, with, I got inspired by the Gowder family, Mikey G and his father. And I was like, I'm going to ask the illest breeder I know how to do it. Yeah. And, um, I went to him. He says to me, so you got to separate out the mail that you like and repot it up about a mile away from everything. And he's like, you put it into a big pot or in the ground just like you do the other plants and you let it get huge and i was like man this is a huge undertaking like this is a serious project yeah but with his wisdom i i went on that kind of route and i had this uh male that was giant in my garden that i let rip and uh i didn't know what the hell to do with it and uh so i banged it a little bit and the pollen drifted on like three plants. And I was like, Oh, well, and I was growing wask at the time. So I was like, I want to make seeds in everything because we use hemp seed. I was like, it'll be even better chocolate milk. Yeah. And so 
I was like, oh, I messed that up. I'm by myself. As we know in cannabis, you can have a lot of friends, but when it comes to working in the field, you're on your own. And I took the plant and I went, whoosh. And the pollen went up like 50 feet in the air with a huge plume. And I was like, and I watched it just crush the entire batch. Nice. And I was like, well, I guess I checked that box. <laughs> and, you know, uh, then you get more into it and, and, you know, really being inspired with learning about, you know, Punnett squares, about, uh, you know, IBLs, S1s, you know, uh, breeding forwards, breeding backwards, and, uh, and all the diversity. And I was in a hot spot in Round Valley that has some of the most ancient genetics, you know, from natives, from uh, veterans, from a lot of people who have grown there over the years. And I was really fortunate with to be able to go to these breeders and start, you know, uh, getting the genetics that I liked. And a breeder told me a long time ago, and he was spot on when he said to me, you know, when you start breeding, you'll figure out what flavors you like. And we all like different flavors. Yeah. And that's going to kind of drive your train. So, you know, with that in mind, then I started to, you know, find specific cultivars and, uh, and growers and reach out to them, build that terroir network and develop, you know, my own. And so fast forward to today, I got a couple more we'll run through. Oh. These are special. Somebody gifted me these at Ego Clash, and they're hemp seeds, James, that grow 25 foot tall hemp plants. Oh, I need some of those. Yes, you're Absolutely. getting them. Right Absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I want you to see how large the seeds are. Take a look. And I got some other seeds, but we can put those next to it. Holy shit. Oh, my God. Big, huge seeds. It is un real how uh i was so pumped i said that's what i went to ego clash for and i was like it's just another like we said the plan is so diverse like no one you can constantly experiment no, these are point zero. I, I would guess i can weigh this and i'm pretty good at guessing weight because i've yeah. done it so much but these are point zero fours. you don't see point zero fours almost never right yeah these are i have some point zero one so these are four times bigger if not bigger than that so I got Trippy. the, here's some other flavors. The lemon cherry skunk. That's awesome. I got G10. Uh, G10, I said, is the highest note you can hit when people sing. Yeah. This shit gets you high. Kicks you in the nuts. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and not only that, are you ready for drum roll? Yeah. Drum roll. Drum roll. We got it. It finishes in August and it's not an autoflower. Really? No autoflower genetics in it. It's got early Afghan genetics okay. that I believe have like this really early photo period. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to sex. Those plants, I've noticed some of these ones that I found and I bred, I have a couple strains that finish in August. I did a collab with Leo uh, and I called one the rainbird. And there's this bird that shows up. Uh, it's also called like the Pikakua. And uh, it shows up before monsoons. And people always talk about science and spirit. And that's a big vice for me in our industry. As we know, there's been lots of turmoil there. So this bird represents the spirit. And uh, science caught up with the bird and they were able to track the bird. And so to prove the lore. Comes to find out, James, the spirit story and the legend is true and that the bird migrates in front of the rain. And so if you see that bird, that means that a monsoon is coming or that the rain is on its way. Hmm. And thus the giving it that name because the cannabis comes in before the rain. And I said the people in Maine, the people in Canada, the people in all these climates need those genetics. Yeah. You know, they are out there in their fields. There's the happiest person and then they're crying because frost came. Yeah. And it just devastated them. 
Speaking of that, we've talked about a frost solution for everyone too. And what we said is to wait till the sun is cresting. And as it's tracking in on the patch, to spray the plants with water. And maybe there's a chance. I haven't tried it yet. But, you know, if you caught it in that window, Mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't burn. And, uh, yeah. So, doing genetics that finish early for people, giving people what they need, you know, working with the plant to make the magic. Yeah. So, the true breeding work is in the pheno hunting and the selection process. 100 seeds minimum. 100 seeds minimum for you to do your selections. Minimum. Yeah. And you do your selections outside? Uh, Mostly? Or you I, do inside I, as well? I, I'm doing them all outside now. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're breeding for outside too. I feel like- Correct. You breed indoors for indoor plants. You breed outdoors. I mean, you can do both. You could do. You, you can make your seeds indoor for outdoor, but I think a lot of guys, when you're doing the selection process, if you're growing for outdoor, you better be selecting for outdoor for that specific region. It's complicated though when I like pass on a plant outdoors because it doesn't check the three boxes. Yeah. One box isn't checked. It's gone. And then my friend calls me up and he's like, do you still have any of number four? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, bro, come over to my greenhouse and take a look. And he's like, it's the one. Yeah. And so... You never know the expressions in the multi-environments. And I'm like, there needs to be more of that and more science, you know, because again, when people come to us for genetics, we might have it. Oh yeah, it doesn't work in this environment, but it slays in this one. Variety testing in multiple environments. It's always good because expressions come so differently. Outdoor from one region to the next can be completely different. Greenhouse can be different side by side with your outdoor. So I'm bringing back the skunk. Did you see the latest issue of uh, Skunk Magazine? I did not. Okay. Well, Julie is an angel. Absolutely. And uh, I got in there uh, with a strain review uh, on the winter issue. Nice. And unlike I've ever seen in any strain reviews, James, I put a male in. That is a first. The that is a first. That's dankest okay. stud, bro. This male blew me away. And it's like, it has a story. Of course, you know, the I'm not worthy plant does. Yeah. And I found this skunk in my patch uh, where I had one plant come up and I thought the patch got sprayed. Wow. Literally, I was looking for a skunk. And I live in the hills. I know what a fucking skunk smells like. Excuse totally. my French. And so then I'm stumbling around the patch looking and I come up on the plant and I'm like, oh, hey, dang, there it is. Pure skunk, putrid. Yeah. Like I said, insane, like overrode every plant in the garden. And I was like excited. And that was the year that I did the open pollination. Yeah. So uh, I didn't know where or when that would show back up. But I collected that seed from uh, the plant, and then um, I dealt with some strife in my life, and uh, I got cancer. And this plant uh, is special to me and has been, you know, my passion, my journey. But little did I know, it was also going to be my savior. And, you know... Uh, Growing out genetics, uh, whether it be CBD, like we said, CBG, THC, it's all medicine. So, you know, I... Uh, whether you believe it or not, it's medicine. <laughs> right. Dennis, got, Dennis Prone said that, but yeah, that's one of the best lines ever. There it is. And uh, so, you know, I kind of had to step back from everything. And my family and my friends helped me get through it. And I got amazing treatment from not only uh, Western medicine, but also Eastern medicine. My sister is a naturopathic doctor and a graduate from Bastyr, big up sis. And so I attacked it with everything. I was eating RSO, bless his heart. I was giving it out in the waiting room. People will say thank you. It's like you can't give out cake there. And when yeah. people are getting uh, 
chemotherapy, but you can give out RSO. And, you know, it hasn't gone full stream where they even have the fake cannabis that they prescribe to people. And it's just the Marinol. The Marinol. Straight trash. Yeah. And so, you know, there's all these great people that are willing to donate. I was donated medicine to help me get through it. Um, with putting one foot in front of the other, I was happy that I could walk through hell. And my family and I uh, persevered on, and now I'm a new version. And I'm happy, James, to say I'm back. Full remission. Full remission. Dude, amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Congratulations. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Glad you're here on the show, man. This and, is great. And, you know, to be able to continue to work with the plant and gone through cancer and come back, you know, it changed me. I'm so much more humbled. I'm so much more grateful. Uh, I appreciate, you know, the elders for their humility. I try to listen more and talk less. Coming back to the table now, uh, I did, uh, I was I was a little bit, uh, you know, in recovery still, but I never gave up. I grew the whole way through. Yeah. And I went up and there's a video on me online where I went out to the field and I said I couldn't hand water that year. And so I put a rain bird out. Yeah. And my whole family went up with me and I said, let's just go chuck seed. And I got bags of seed, right? So I'm like, I can just toss it like Johnny Appleweed. Yeah. And uh, went out there and told people about how great it was. and Direct sowing. Direct <laughs> sowing. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's Moroccan style. The Moroccan <laughs> style. Or Las Vegas style. <laughs> My, one of the, uh, we should intersect here because it's radical. Uh, no manners. You ever heard of the manners family? No, maybe. Manners family. He's a quad OG, or was, rest in peace, Noel. Uh, the Capistrana, you ever heard that name? Mm -hmm. He invented the heart stint, and he owns a ranch in Covalo, and he's about as tough as they come. Yeah. And he still runs cattle, like cowboys down the road with leather coats, and they got their McNabb dogs, and they block traffic, and they ride through. And he's a real rancher. And at Noel's Wake, uh, Capistrana came up to me with the cowboy hat and he said, you know what Noel was? He said, Noel was a quad OG. And I'd never heard that before. And he said, that's high as it gets. So, you know, I named a strain after him with that. I had to, you know, get on that a little bit, quad OG. Nice. And uh, yeah, Noel is the person that brought the Afgu, and their family farms is Gooey Farms. Nice. And uh, he was kind of Eddie Lepp page with crows everywhere you look, working with huge amounts of people. He told me stories about doing the loops from California to Texas with duffel bags in the airports and uh, back to Las Vegas. So he, I'm riding in his car. Uh, you know, you're pretty special to ride with the Godfather. And I'm wondering what we're going to talk about. One of my favorite places to be in the car. He says to me, I went to uh, Las Vegas and I was working with this guy and he was growing in pools and he ripped out 12 pools and they were in all these different places and they would just go like me and open broadcast seed and then grow it up in the pool. Crazy. And so he said he went to check in on things with his partner and that uh, the person uh, coming to the gate was late and he was in a fancy, like the guy had a fancy Corvette and was sipping around because he's the magic man, right? And Noel is a partner with, and so he's trying to impress him. And the guy that came up to the gate, he goes off on him and it was his son. And he started yelling at him, why weren't you here? You should have been here. You knew we were coming. And so the godfather said, red flag, there's something wrong. Hmm. And so he said, I called up my family. I told them that I didn't think I was going to be able to come home and that I was going to have to see this thing through. And he said he stayed a couple of days. And sure enough, 
there were like three more other buyer or partners that he didn't know about. Oh, wow. So he had to stay there and see the course from, from, you know, middle to finish. And he said to me, you know, the hard part was when I told that to my family, she said, that's okay, his wife, but I might not be here when you come home. And he stayed. Yeah. And she wasn't there when he came home. And that was a story, you know, that when you hear it, it changes you. And he shared it with me for a reason. And, you know, I'm grateful again to have my family. And again, they learned to get along later. And he had a, 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 another relationship. And I love seeing families that can separate and then hang out in the room and be have a good time. And thus me, the black sheep, that's not how it went with my family a lot of the time. So where'd the name came from? It's so he from. brought in all the, you're talking about Gooey. Yeah, now. where'd the name came No, black sheep. Oh, where'd black the name sheep. black yeah. sheep come from? Uh, that came from, you know, my family background of being a, uh, a kind of a rogue character, getting into cannabis, doing different things. And then, you know, I had a lot of fallout. Uh, my dad battled with his family. They had restraining orders. My, uh, mother had to pull him off his brother, you know, and take his guns away. So it got pretty ugly. And, you know, I said, we were a band of two and me and pops, you know, uh, tread the uh, ground, uh, with class for a long time. And my mom and him got separated, and I'm good with my mother. She's an amazing uh, uh, person in my life as well. Bless moms, all moms. Good stuff. Well, yeah. So, what what's your take on social media? Social media. I'm. I I think that there's great things. I like. You know, it's like a multiverse. I guess. You know, it's yeah. It's a blessing and a curse. Yeah. The, there's. The, I don't want to be scrolling. And have my kids call me out, Dad, you're scrolling on your phone, right? I don't like eating food and seeing people on scrolling, you know? Sure. Uh, but I do like the connectivity. I do like how many fun people we've reached out to, like that this show is going to touch. Yeah. You know, the shine. And I'm like, I any of the beef or the haters, that's fine. And all the more you come up, the more they are. It's just a... It's just a, uh, you know, props to you because you're actually doing something. And it's like me and you are working on very important work and it's not of the moment. It's of what people will remember in my mind. And, you know, to build the legend, to build the legacy. So if somebody wants to find out more about you or get your genetics, where can they go? They can go to uh, Dark Heart. Uh, I heard he said, I was talking with him or not dark heart. I'm sorry. Dark star, dark star, dark star. Nice. Uh, and, uh, he said Tito was on your show and that he gave him some props too. Yeah. Yeah. Tino's the man. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that was cool. He was like props, two different shows on James loud. Let's go. Nice. Good and stuff. Detroit rock city. Yeah. I love to get my genetics there. I've got about eight or nine different places throughout the U S that you can find, uh, seed banks that I'm available on your black sheep genetics on Instagram, black sheep genetics. You have some great reels. Yep. You, you're a family man. You do some really cool stuff. So yeah, it's been great having you on the show. We Thank got my, you, my new breeding book. Uh, you guys want to check out the breeding book. This is out now. You can go to James we got this fun book that has uh, 380 pages about genetics and plants and all my uh, favorite things. We grow together. So on yes. a final note, I wanted to tell you, because this is really special. So this bud is, I'm calling it the leather because it's tough. When you smoke it, you're going to get faded. And uh, it's from uh, the legendary family that we spoke of, the Gouders. And James, guy that's helping him out building his rooms, uh, one of his right-hand men said that he worked with the guy that grew this in Kovala. Yeah. Where I'm like, it's a small world. 
Yeah, so my guy Matt, he's the head grower uh, with James Loud Genetics. He, <laughs> small world, yeah, and used so to work the, with the guy that grew the flower that's in your hand. Which I let's think it, give it's him amazing. his name because he, I gave him a nickname because he's he's just a rogue character. He lives in a cave, so I'm coined him the Caveman. Nice, that's his new nickname, and he likes it, so it's gonna stick. And this weed was cured in a cave, and I'm like some estate aging. Where, you know, I had to do some love when I got at home a little bit, but the long cure, getting getting wet, getting dry, but not too much. No fuzz on this. Yeah, yeah. And just bringing out those great flavors. So part of the gift is, James, that this is my favorite strain of the year. That's awesome. And there's seeds in it for you. That's even better. And so That's like, even you better. You got yet. the genetics. You get to smoke it through. One of my favorite ways to pull seeds out is to smoke them through it. Drop them in a little special jar. We'll run some here. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Boom. So big up to this, the leather, all the people growing out there. It's not you. It's not me. It's us. It's Thanks us. for having me on. Thank you so much for coming. I look forward to having you back someday. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.